Hey everyone, this is Anna from Texas Restaurant Association. We'll get started in just a minute. I'm gonna let a few more people sort of filter into the, the webinar room and then we'll get going. Hope everyone is doing okay out there. I know it's um, not been a great week for a lot of us. Uh, TRA is definitely committed to taking care of you guys. So um, if you need anything or have any uh, questions, there's been especially a lot of questions related to employment and then mixed beverage curbside. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. Um, you can, if you just respond to the confirmation email, you'll be able to get a hold of me. Um, again, my name is Anna Tazen. I'm the Chief Revenue and Innovation Officer here for Texas Restaurant Association. Obviously, you can see we're all uh, working from home this week, so that's why sort of the casual look in my bookshelf behind us. Um, I'm really, really happy that we're doing this webinar. Uh, we were able to put it together really fast. Our friends, Jackson Lewis, who are the founding participants in the TRA Law Center, are going to discuss a lot of complicated issues to some questions that have been coming up a lot lately around restaurant employers and their staff and what to do. And I know you'll have some very, very specific questions. Um, as they are lawyers, they will do their best to, to be specific without giving uh, legal advice. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, I'm sure they'll be able to answer some questions for you off the webinar as well. So Tally Parker and Ethan Davis are both with Jackson Lewis. I really appreciate you guys coming into the office and suiting up and looking ready to go. I know it's going to be really beneficial for a lot of our attendees of the webinar. So I'll just kick it over to you guys. All right, Anna. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all the members for joining us, uh, especially today and in the times that we're in uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the coronavirus and how uh, it's impacting all of your workforces and things that might be coming up down the pike. Uh, as Anna said, my name is Tally Parker. I'm a principal uh, with Jackson Lewis in the Dallas office, and I'm with my colleague today, Ethan Davis. Um, before we get going, we did, just because this is our first opportunity uh, as the TRA's founding member for employment law, just to tell you just a little bit about our firm before we get going. As I said, we're with Jackson Lewis. We are a nationwide labor employment law firm. We do only workplace law. We're scattered throughout the country in a little over 60 offices, uh, have close to 1,000 lawyers, again, really doing anything that touches on the workplace. That's our focus. Uh, we're proud to be a part of Working with the TRA, we have a number of industry groups in our firm, one of which is hospitality, and then we have a subsector of that, which is the restaurant industry group, and Ethan and I are members of that, and we're kind of captaining uh, our firm's relationship with TRA. Uh, we wish we were here to talk to you guys under different circumstances uh, and about a different subject matter, but nonetheless, it's our honor and privilege to be able to chat with you guys today and share a little bit of knowledge with you that, that hopefully you can apply and use in your businesses. Uh, as you all know, we don't need to tell you, uh, you know, major challenges out there right now for hospitality uh, more broadly and then certainly with respect to the restaurant industry. Uh, this slide when I had it prepared yesterday was going to note that in certain parts around the state, dine-in service was prohibited uh, in places like Dallas and Fort Worth, Austin and San Antonio. And then late yesterday afternoon, as you all now know, Governor Abbott passed uh, an, an order uh, in which he across the state shut down dine and eating. And so that's, that's the environment you guys are all uh, operating in. Uh, and it's going to be that way at least for the next two weeks. Uh, that, that order, of course, took effect today and will remain in place uh, at a minimum through uh, April 3rd, which is two weeks from today, and, and of course could possibly be extended. As you guys know and as you're seeing in your businesses, uh, most customers, folks like us who aren't uh, directly in the restaurant industry, uh, we're, we're either eating a lot more at home uh, with food that we've bought at the grocery store, uh, given the run on the grocery stores, uh, or we're using things like DoorDash um, or Uber Eats to get food from your restaurants. On the way into work today, uh, the CEO of Grubhub was on CNBC. I was listening to that in my car, uh, and he said, the CEO said that their uh, intake, their orders that they're fulfilling, uh, is, is up dramatically. He said it's up 5x from what it normally is under normal conditions, and that's what it's going to continue to look like uh, as, as states all across the country are rolling out uh, orders like Governor Abbott did yesterday. Uh, I'm sure there are some folks on this webinar uh, who you de you've decided to close your, your restaurant temporarily. Uh, we've got a couple of restaurants. We're in downtown Dallas. That's where we are today 
couple of restaurants right around us that we normally frequent that they're just closed. Uh, they're shuttered until uh, this thing gets a little bit better and they can bring the staff back around uh, and customers and patrons will be around uh, and, and, and be ready to eat meals there. Uh, downtown Dallas is pretty quiet right now, so it probably just from an economic perspective makes sense for those folks to go ahead and just close their restaurants. Others are taking a different approach. Others are simply reducing hours for their staff or they're having to do cutbacks, making tough decisions. And we're going to talk about that a little on uh, later in our webinar. I, I note again, not telling you guys really anything you don't know, but on Wednesday, the National Restaurant Association, uh, in seeking relief from the federal government and seeking stimulus money, uh, sent a letter to President Trump. Uh, and in that letter, the National Restaurant Association said, look, we need help. Uh, the impact, the economic impact, of this coronavirus, uh, it's expected to affect five to seven million jobs in our country in the near term. Uh, and also from a, a dollar perspective, we think we could end up losing as an industry $225 billion. Uh, we need your help. Um, despite all those challenges though, despite kind of the, the change in your business model, your operational model right now, uh, as you all know, health and safety of, of your employees and then certainly the customers uh, who you service, it's paramount. Uh, and even though we are in these challenging times, unprecedented times, you have legal obligations and they still exist. Um, uh, we see a lot of activity in our day-to-day -day, uh, job before coronavirus outbreak, a lot of litigation stemming from restaurants. Um, and that possibility certainly exists coming out of coronavirus where folks are having, the, having to make decisions on the fly, having to decide things very rapidly. Uh, but the legal obligation still exists. There's still going to be plaintiff's lawyers when this thing is all said and done who are going to be looking for claims. They're going to be going to your workers. They're going to be trying to find things that you guys haven't done correctly. They're going to be looking for missteps uh, because they're going to try to bring some claims after all of this is settled. So that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the time. Uh, we're going to hit on uh, some topics and some things that I know are all of interest to you guys. What type of questions can you ask your employees? What, if any, type of uh, examinations can you conduct on them to make sure that they are healthy and it's safe for them to be in the workplace? We're going to talk about the new law that President Trump signed uh, about 36 hours ago, the Family First Act. Uh, Ethan's going to tell you what that requires because uh, I assume it applies to a lot of the, the companies uh, who are participating in this webinar today given the size of your operations. I'm going to chat a little bit about wage and hour uh, laws and, and how those still apply during this time and what you need to be mindful of. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll probably close out the program um, by talking about those tough decisions that you guys have maybe already had to make or might have to make in the future. Uh, talk about furloughs, talk about layoffs, talk about closures, uh, and then you know getting some economic support to your workers if you've had to do that via unemployment benefits. Um, and we're going to try to answer the questions that we think are uh, the ones that are probably top of mind for you all. Um, but if not, we'll have time for questions. And, and if we're not able to get to them all today, we have our last slide here. We have all of our contact info, our emails, and our phone numbers. And you guys can reach out to us uh, after this webinar if there's any specific questions uh, that you were wanting answered in this that you didn't get answered. So with that, Ethan, why don't you uh, take it from here? Yeah. So as, as Tally mentioned, I think that was a good introduction that you know, these are challenging times, these are unprecedented times, but, you know, as legal obligations still exist, and one of the other things he talked about is keeping your customers and your staff safe, that's still paramount. So just kind of a brief lay of the land of where we're at right now. Um, the World Health Organization, WHO, has declared that COVID-19 is an international pandemic. And what that means, during a pandemic, employers are encouraged to rely on the latest CDC local and state public health assessments. And this is changing. You know, as Tally noted, the Families First Act, that was signed into law 36 hours ago. Governor Abbott issued his order yesterday afternoon. This is changing by the day. Something could be different tomorrow than it is today. So it's important that you guys try to remain current and try to stay up to date on the latest developments because this is a rapidly changing um, situation. And so some of the things, you know, that you might be wondering, especially, you know, with the coronavirus being declared an international pandemic is what can you say to your employees? What can you ask your employees? What can you do with your employees? Um, it is okay. You can ask your employees if they themselves have tested positive or if they're experiencing symptoms that would be associated with COVID-19. You can also ask your employees if they've come into contact with someone who has COVID-19, um, or you can ask them if they've visited a designated WHO 
Joe or CDC affected region. Um, if any employees answer yes to those questions, you can direct them to stay home and that's fine. But here, as Tally noted, plaintiff's lawyers are going to be looking for claims when this is all said and done. So you want to make sure that you treat employees consistently. You know, you, you don't want to pick a specific country um, and say, you know, any employee who said they visited country X that's on the list, I'm going to make you go home and stay home and stay out of work. But if, if employees have visited country Y that's also on the list, you know, you, you can't have them coming to work, remaining at work when you're prohibiting employees to visit another country on the list from coming into work. So you want to make sure that you're treating, treating employees consistently so you don't face any of those discrimination claims that might arise later. And so in addition to kind of this rapidly changing environment, um, there are a couple agencies um, that are putting forth guidance to try to help employers, try to help the workforce understand what's going on, how you can be acting in the workplace, how you can treat your employees, um, and how your employees are expected to engage around customers. The Equal, Oppor the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, that's one of those federal agencies that is offering guidance on how employers should act due to the spread of coronavirus. Um, generally, you guys all know the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That prohibits an employer from making disability-related inquiries, for example, requiring medical examinations of employees, except under limited circumstances. One of those limited circumstances when you can make what is otherwise known as a medical examination request is when there's a direct threat. Um, and a direct threat, the EEOC has defined that as a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of individuals or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by reasonable accommodation. And so why this is relevant here is because COVID-19 has been declared an international pandemic. And so the EEOC has determined that this is considered a direct threat, which would allow employers to take action that otherwise you shouldn't or should be more hesitant to do so in the workplace. And so one of the questions that we're frequently asked is, you know, can I take an employee's temperature? And so generally, you know, in, in, under normal circumstances, that's not something that you would be permitted to do. You can't take an employee's temperature as they're coming into the workplace for your regular Tuesday morning shift. But because of the direct threat that's at play here and the guidance that's issued by the EEOC, where they've acknowledged that there are, you know, this community spread, they're issuing precautions. Employers currently are permitted to measure an employee's body temperature when they're coming into work. So while it's not something you are normally permitted to do because of the spread of COVID-19 and how it's been declared an international pandemic, employers are permitted to take an employee's body temperature as they're coming into work. Yeah, and if I could just hop in here. Oh yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Anna. I have some questions. Yeah, what I was, what I was gonna, what I was gonna say is, Guys, uh, go to the EEOC's website. Go to it often. Um, these questions, we started getting them on Monday. You know, I think for the most part, I know that, that there was outbreak already, uh, but it, to me, kind of everything kind of changed maybe on Friday or Saturday of last week. Uh, and so we started getting a lot of questions from employers on Monday of, hey, when my workers show up, can we do temperature tests? Can we give them questionnaires? Can we ask them where they've been? Can we ask them if they have any of these symptoms? Frankly, at that time, we were a little, little, little nervous, a little unsure about telling them yes to those questions. Um, but the EEOC, as the week went on, I believe it was on Tuesday, because that issue was coming up so much, the EEOC issued guidance. The EEOC, as Ethan said, said, yeah, in these circumstances, you can ask those questions. In these circumstances, we're fine with the temperature testing. I say that to illustrate that you guys need to regularly visit the EEOC's website because they're putting out guidance, they're putting out FAQs, uh, probably answering a lot of the questions that you all have. It's a great resource. I also want to note before we move on that our own state, the Texas Workforce Commission, the agency in the state that deals with unemployment benefits, they've got a lot of great resources on their webpage too, uh, devoted to COVID-19. They've got some FAQs that they've put out as well. We were looking at them earlier today. Uh, those FAQs talk about unemployment benefits, since that's primarily what the TWC is tasked with, but they also answer some of these same questions. The TWC is weighing in on temperature screenings. The TWC is weighing in on, can we ask employees about their symptoms and where they've been? Um, so I wanted to point that out to you guys, and, and before I toss it back to Anna for, for, for a question, I do want to note that while the EEOC is saying temperature screenings and questionnaires of your employees is fine, it's permissible to do that, Note that what you're getting back from those employees is confidential medical information. 
Uh, and so you do have an obligation as employer to keep that information confidential, uh, not to share it with anyone who doesn't have a need to know basis. Uh, and if you are keeping a log or keeping track of whether someone has symptoms or where they've been, I think it's fine to keep that in the near term. For example, if you sent someone home because they did have a high temperature, you probably want a record of that so you know uh, when they haven't come for a couple of days after that why. But you know, in a couple of weeks or perhaps when we get this under control, you're going to want to make sure you go back and destroy those records. You're not going to want to ha hang on to them and have them out there where perhaps someone could get them uh, and, and be able to see that confidential medical information. Yeah. Oh, okay, that was a lot of stuff like all, all at the front. So thank you guys for that. Um, okay, I have a couple questions though on this. Um, how can you take, okay, if you're, if each employee is coming in, like, is it okay to ask them about their symptoms or if they've seen a doctor like every single day? Or uh, do you need to do it like every, every few days? Or what does that look like? Just for asking about symptoms or doctor visits? Yeah, I think it depends on what your resources are. Uh, it's fine to do it every day. Um, right. in, in fact, one of the clients I work with uh, has a large plant, several thousand workers coming to that plant every day. Uh, they're heading off those workers before they have to come through a turnstile at this place. They're heading off those workers at the beginning of the workday. They've contracted out to have nurses on site, and it doesn't have to be nurses. Again, one of these things that's changing. At the start of the week, we were saying, yeah, it needs to be a trained medical uh, professional, but the EEOC has realized yeah, that's tough. Those folks are tied up, right? They're busy right now. It's fine to have someone else within your organization do it. I probably wouldn't have, you know, the receptionists out there taking temperatures, but, but it's fine to have someone uh, who has just at least some training in this, and, and they don't have to be a, a medical professional. They could get some training online, for example. Um, but yes, we've got, we've got clients who have someone every single day when the workers come in taking their temperature uh, and asking those same questions, not necessarily on day two, have you been to any of these places, because they told us that on day one, but on day two, do you have any of these symptoms, right? Because we know the incubation period for coronavirus is 14 days, things could change every day. So yes, that's perfectly permissible, but at the same time, if, if you don't have the resources, can't devote that time and attention to it daily, then perhaps do it maybe you know, every two or every three days. Sure. And then whenever you're actually taking the temperature of the employee, I mean, should, does that need to be in like a private area? Because obviously you want to maintain some confidentiality, but a restaurant is kind of like an, an open space. So if, if you take someone's temperature, say, I'm assuming like using one of the little, the little things that like measure the temperature on the head. I don't know what they're called, like a thermometer that touches the head is probably the best thing to use. But like if people see everyone coming through and we're taking temperature, each time, obviously, if someone is told like, hey, just go stand over here for a second, they're being singled out. And so it's a little obvious what's going on, right? It, it, it is, it is. Uh, and, but, but you know, that client I have, again, it had people that turn styles, they're doing it kind of out there. And I told them, I said, hey, if, 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 if you can, and a lot of this is, you know, what, a, what does the landscape look like? If it's possible to pull people into a room, take their temperature and then exit them before someone else comes in and someone else can see where those people wound up, right? Did they go right or did they go left? That of course would be ideal. But look, you know, we're operating in different circumstances here. Uh, it might not be possible. Um, and, and so, yeah, you're right. Someone might see that this person went right when everybody else is going left and learn something. But uh, if it's not practical, if it's not feasible to bring them into a certain room, then, then I still think that's okay. okay. Um, and if customers see it, I think customers are going to appreciate it, right? Customers are going to know that, hey, you're taking this obviously seriously and, and anybody who is in the establishment who they may be interacting with if they're coming to pick up their food or anybody who's making their food, they've been tested and those individuals uh, don't have COVID-19. So I think it's, it's also just good from a business sense. Sure, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I do see we have questions coming in for people asking about new FMLA. And I know you guys are going to get to that later. So we'll, we're going to get to that. We'll get, yeah, we'll get to that. Thanks, guys. And just one other thing I'd like to add to what Tally was saying, and this is kind of similar to what I was talking about earlier. You know, I, I think a consistent theme for all of these, you know, we are in unprecedented times, a consistent theme that, you know, you guys want to remember when you're taking care of your folks, you're taking care of your employees is to treat them consistently. So if your employees come in and day one, you ask everyone on a Monday, you know, I'm going to take your temperature, you take their temperature, and then day two, you start singling people out, you know, you're, you're opening yourselves up to future claims. You know, if, if there could be a reason for that, you know, if you've decided day one, we're going to take everyone's temperature, that's fine. And then for anyone who says that they have visited this certain region, um, you know, we don't want to make them go home, they're exhibiting no symptoms, um, we're going to take their temperature day two, 
you know, make sure you're treating consistently with that. You don't want to, you know, if everyone says, I haven't been anywhere, I haven't been exposed to anything, I'm showing no symptoms, you don't want to take someone's temperature in that category, but also decide, I don't need to take someone else's temperature who's giving you the same exact answers. Um, so just kind of moving through, if an employee's sick at work, I think this dovetails nicely. You know, your establishments, your restaurants, you have a duty to maintain a safe and healthy workplace. You know, that obligation is always there. That doesn't go away. And I think a lot of, you know, what we're talking about, a lot of um, it's kind of new guidance is they help reestablish that principle that, you know, it's really important that you guys take care of your employees, you take care of your customers, and, you know, people are expecting a safe and healthy workplace. Um, so if an employee or even a prospective employee tests positive, um, what can you do? You can, you know, as we noted, you can tell, tell people who have said that they've tested positive you can you can leave the premises you know you can require them to leave and you know that's that might seem obvious but what might not have seemed obvious is a prospective employee you know you've made a conditional job offer you're allowed to after a conditional job offer is made to require an employee to go through this medical testing to take their temp what it would otherwise be medical testing to take their temperature and if someone's positive you're not supposed to let them into the workplace. You can rescind a job offer. That's something you have the right to do. You can delay their start date. You can choose to go that route. So you, you have the ability to do that if you've made a conditional offer of employment, but you find out that this prospective employee is about to come on board, has tested positive, or is uh, you know has been exposed. You, you can rescind offers. You can delay start dates. That's something that's fine to do. One, one, one thing I want to note here, guys, if, if you do have someone who tests positive here for COVID-19, you absolutely should send them home. Uh, and they should not come back into work until, you know, they, the, the, the disease, the virus has run its course and they are no longer infected with it. You don't want to have them in your workplace. Um, that's, that's something you should do in, in any industry, but, but certainly in the restaurant industry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and one thing I'd also note real quickly is if someone does test positive for COVID-19, this is something we're getting questions about. Um, you don't want to identify that person, though, to the extent you can. Uh, you don't want to identify that person to your workers um, because, again, that's confidential medical information. To the extent you can, you want to keep that individual's identity uh, private uh, and not share that. But obviously, if someone uh, has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and you think they've been around other employees, those employees, when they learn that that person's not coming into work anymore, they may say, what's going on here? Uh, do I need to be concerned about myself? Um, I think, again, best practice would be not to share the information with those folks, but hey, look, I'm going to be practical here. And being practical, I think you want to, you know, if, if, if those folks, you know, were within a six six foot radius. We shouldn't be doing this today, but we are for you guys for the webinar. But if folks have been in that proximity with someone they, that you know has now tested positive for COVID-19, I think practically speaking, you, you need to tell those individuals so that they can go get tested themselves uh, and they know that, that, that they, may then, they, they may themselves be infected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the, you, you can require employees to wear protective equipment such as gloves or masks. Um, you know, just be mindful though, there's you know, clearly a national shortage of at least mask gloves. You know, those are probably in abundance. You can probably have gloves around all your establishments at all times. Um, masks may be harder to come by, but, you know, if you do have them, if they're available, you, you, can, you can require that your employees wear them as just kind of an extra layer of protection. Um, when an employee is out sick, you can require a doctor's note before they return. Um, that is permitted under the ADA because you know, for one of two reasons, either it's not disability related if it's due to, you know, a, you know, a COVID-19 type situation, or it's justified under the ADA because, you know, the pandemic is severe and a direct threat. So you can kind of, you know, it's something you can require doctors know if you know that an employee's been out sick themselves. What we would say just kind of as a practical matter, you know, if, if an employee has been out to take care of, you know, a child, for example, you know, you're not sure if the employee, if the you know child is sick, or you're not sure if you know someone may have been exposed. You're not sure. You know you don't necessarily need to require. You know you can't necessarily require a doctor's note in that situation. You know the regular ADA regulations still apply to that. You know this is kind of specifically for you know an employee if they inform you they themselves are sick, and just also as a practical matter, you know doctors are inundated right now with 
all of this COVID-19 issues, you know, they're flooded. They don't have time to return calls, emails. You know, you just be mindful that if you're trying to get say, tell someone you need this doctor's note, that's not high up on the doctor's list. They might not be able to provide the note ASAP, you know, as fast as, as they can. It might take a little bit more time um, than under normal circumstances when you can get a doctor's note, you know, pretty much same day. Right. All right, so let's talk uh, before Ethan shifts gears and talks about what I think probably a lot of you guys want to hear about, uh, and that is the new Families First Act passed two days ago. But I want to mention a few wage and hour issues. You know, this is where restaurants, uh, in my experience, uh, probably see the most claims. Um, wage and hour, that is the Fair Labor Standards Act. That's the federal wage and hour law that we here in Texas have to follow. We don't have any state wage and hour laws, but uh, these are the claims that restaurants often find themselves defending. Uh, and I think there'll probably be a lot of FLSA claims coming out of COVID-19 uh, when everything returns to normal. So I just want to revisit some of the basics for you all here so that you all don't uh, fall, fall, you know, step. There's a lot of traps for the unwary here and don't want you guys to fall into them. First of all, I suspect that most of your workers in your uh, establishments are non-exempt uh, or as you know, the public generally refers to them, hourly workers, right? Uh, and those individuals, where, whether they're tipped individuals or whether you're just paying them on a flat hourly rate, of course the rule with respect to them is they've got to at least be paid minimum wage, $7.25 an hour, and they really only have to be paid for the actual hours worked. Um, and so I mentioned that because it might be an example where someone was scheduled to be working three days a week, and now you really only need them working two days a week. Just because there's been a change in their schedule doesn't mean that you have to still pay them for the hours they would have worked on the day that they're no longer going to work. You only have to pay the non-exempt or the hourly workers minimum wage for hours that they actually work. Um, I want to talk just for a second about your salaried employees, uh, those exempt salaried employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Those are the individuals who aren't eligible for overtime. Uh, in most establishments, that's going to be the managers, uh, maybe in some establishments also the uh, assistant managers. But for those individuals, generally speaking, if they perform any work during the work week, you got to pay them their entire salary for that week, okay? Uh, again, so let's talk about that situation where maybe the assistant manager or the manager who was salaried exempt normally works five days a week. Maybe now you're going to close your restaurant one day a week, or maybe you just don't need them in there uh, two or three days of the week that they normally would be there. Uh, when you make that decision, if they've performed any work during that week, you still got to pay them their whole salaries if they were working the entire week. Um, however, if you were going to do a furlough, which is something I'll talk about later on in this program, which is where you have individuals still employed, but you're telling them don't come in for a certain period of time, and maybe you've told them on a Friday, we're going to put you on a, a one week on, one week off furlough, then for that first week, that first week off, if they don't perform any work during that week, then you're not required to pay them a salary. And that's something a lot of employers are looking at. I was reading an article earlier today that Halliburton has furloughed thousands of workers, um, and they're going to a one week on, one week off setting. Um, the really important thing to note is during that week when the workers are off, you got to make sure that they're not performing any work for you, because if they perform any work, then you've got to pay them the salary for that entire week. Uh, and then finally on this, of course, if you do change uh, an individual's hours, change their schedule, um, and they do have PTO that, that they've accrued under your company's policies, you know, they should still be permitted to use that PTO consistent with those policies. I, I've talked earlier today about some guidance that the EEOC has recently published and the Texas Workforce Commission. I do want you all to know that the Federal Department of Labor has also published some FAQs on these wage and hour issues, these pay issues that, that, that restaurants and, and other employers are, are facing that they've raised to the Department of Labor. And I didn't want to put the link here. It'd be too long and it'd be too, too difficult to, to write down and track down. But if you just go to Google, if you just Google DOL, FLSA, COVID-19, I think the first or the second thing that's going to come up is going to be DOL's guidance on these wage and hour issues associated with COVID-19. I know you all are busy, but I would encourage you just to check those out. Probably take you two or three minutes to read it. There'll probably be something on there of interest to you and, and probably will answer a question or two uh, that you do have. So those are the wage and hour issues I wanted to refresh, and I'll visit them again a little later on in talking about layoffs and furloughs. But now let's talk really about probably what a lot of you, as I said, want to hear about, uh, the new law passed by President Trump. Take it away. Yeah. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was signed into law a couple of days ago on March 18th. 
Um, so just kind of some background information that we can kind of delve into some more of the details. So essentially, some of the, two of the main provisions that directly affect um, restaurants are it contains paid FMLA and paid sick leave provisions. And this new law, the Families First Act, the, both the paid FMLA and the paid sick leave provisions will apply to employees, employers, excuse me, with fewer than 500 employees. Um, so that's kind of the max, you know, so if you have 499 employees at your restaurant or less, that's who it applies to. And the DOL, the Department of Labor, can exempt businesses with fewer than 50 employees when the imposition of such requirements jeopardize the viability of the business. What that means is if you have 40 employees, you have 30 employees at your restaurant, and you think that um, paid FMLA and paid sick leave, and we're going to go over kind of what you need to provide under the Families First Act, that if you have less than 50 employees, you, you can apply to the DOL for an exemption and say, hey, wait a second, you know, this, this will really hurt our business. This may put us out of business if we have to provide this leave. You know, we think we should get an exemption. So that's something that, you know, that carve out is there so that, you know, as of now, if you have less than 50 employees, you know, you'd be covered under the act, but you do have the ability to be exempted. Um, so that's something that's a step that you would need to take to get that exemption. Um, the timing of it, the all these changes we're talking about, they take effect on April 2nd. So, you know, it's, it's, it's coming up soon. This is something that's kind of right around the corner. Um, but notably, unlike, you know, the FMLA, you know, which is been, you know, has kind of is in existence in perpetuity at this point, you know, these benefits, these paid benefits expire at a certain date and they'll, they'll expire on December 31st, 2020. So this isn't designed to be a long-term thing. This, you know, this act was in direct response to, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and kind of all the issues and the uncertainty, um, you know, in these kind of unprecedented times that we're having. And, you know, the hope is that by December 31st, the end of this year, you know, everyone will be back on their feet, you know, things will kind of be back to normal and that, you know, these additional benefits that they're, you know, are being provided for in the act won't be necessary anymore. Um, how is it paid for? You know, that's obviously a big question. The employers themselves are responsible for initially paying the benefits. You need to directly pay the sick leave. You need to pay the paid portion of the FMLA, but you receive a refundable tax credit, um, you know, when for doing so. So upfront, the costs are borne by the employer, and then you're supposed to get that back in the form of a refundable tax credit. Yeah, and I don't know, I of course can't tell who's on the line or who's participating in this webinar. Uh, it, it may be um, independent operators who have one restaurant with five employees. Uh, it may be someone who owns multiple restaurants with 600 employees. I don't know. But bottom line here is for this law, if, you're t if your company, not your individual restaurant, but if your company uh, has fewer than 500 employees, then this law affects you. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just limited to 500 employees, a single establishment, a single site. If your operating company has less than 500 employees, then in 13 days on April 2nd, this is a law that's going to impact you and it's something that you're going to have to comply with. I, I bet, Andy, you might have a question or two, but we've got one more slide on this. Let me run through those just in case they address you, address sure, the question. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the act covers empl employees, basically employees who are unable to work or telework to care for their minor child um, in a situation where the child's elementary school or middle school or daycare has been closed um, due to a public health emergency. That's what this amended FMLA covers. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a narrow circumstance. The closure of a child's school or child's child care, that's the only reason allowed for this paid leave under this amended FMLA. Um, so, for example, schools throughout Texas are currently closed through April 3rd, 2020. Um, you know, so once once this law, you know, if schools in Texas, if they're if that closure is extended longer than April 3rd, um, you know, this is something that could very well kick in, you know, for a lot of your employees that they may they may be the sole, you know, if they go to daycare and their daycare is closed, you may be their only option for child care. And so you would be covered under this act. Um, it's, it's important to note this, this FMLA that's from the, from the Families First Act, it's, it's not as broad as, you know, the FMLA that you're all used to. This, this is limited to the single, the single kind of group that, you know, the government wants to protect, which is, you know, being responsible, helping parents be responsible or child care providers, you know, for children when their child care providers are closed. 
Um, this applies to employees who've been employed for at least 30 calendar days. Um, so that's different than normal FMLA requirements. Normal FMLA requirements, you know, you have the employees have to be employed for 1,250 hours. You know, here it's 30 calendar days. It's a much smaller time frame. More employees are going to be covered under this than regular FMLA. Um, other FMLA requirements that don't apply, 50 employees within a 75-mile radius. Again, that's something that's not applicable here. This is, you know, it's for a narrower reason for providing child care, but it's designed to cover a much broader scope um, to help, you know, people in these trying times. Um, one other thing that, you know, should be noted, the FMLA's requirement that an employee be restored to the same or equivalent position doesn't apply to an employer with 25 or less employees if position no longer exists due to, you know, this economic downturn. So typically, when someone's on a job-protected FMLA leave, you know, you have an obligation to return them to a same or similar situation. You know, obviously, you know, those jobs might not be there at the end of, you know, this brief FMLA period. You know, they may come back later in the future. Um, but at the time the employee's coming back and ready to return to work, they may not be there. Um, and so, you know, this law kind of recognizes that, especially for kind of the smaller restaurants, you may not be able to place employees back in the position they were in. Um, so it's kind of, you know, protecting companies in that way. And uh, just for kind of the payment purposes, so you guys get an understanding of kind of the lay of the land of, you know, your pay requirements. Um, first 10 days that employees take this emergency leave, this emergency FMLA leave are unpaid. Um, however, while it's unpaid under the FMLA, if your employee says, you know, I want to get paid for this, can I use my PTO? They can do that. So if an employee elects to use PTO or if as the restaurant, you know, you say, we want you to use your PTO, use your personal leave, um, you, you can require employees to use pay time off or they can elect to use pay time off. But if you don't require that, if they don't elect that, the first 10 days are unpaid. Um, after 10 days, there is, um, you know, you get up to the full 12 weeks of leave, similar to the regular FMLA, um, and that will be paid at two-thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay, and that's also a cap of $200 a day and $10,000 in the aggregate. So based on, based on how much money your employee makes, doesn't mean you're paying employees, you know, two-thirds of their pay every day for 12 weeks. That's not what the law is. The law is basically saying, you know, at max, they'll get two-thirds of their pay up until they get $200 a day, and 10,000 in the aggregate. So that's that's kind of the upper limitations um, on what you could be responsible for payment-wise as an employer. That's the FMLA piece, but then there's also the paid sick leave piece of the Families First bill. So talk about that for a minute, Ethan. Yeah, and so this, this is kind of the other main component of the Families First Act and kind of, um, you know, the other new, new issue that you guys should all be aware of. So beginning April 2nd, you know, the same day that this you know, this all that FMLA kicks in. Employers must immediately make available 80 hours of paid sick leave for employees or the equivalent of the average hours over two weeks for the part-time employees. So that means is for all your full-time employees who work in 80 hours a week, they need to be immediately, you know, they immediately have in the bank 80 hours of paid sick leave. If you have a part-time employee who works 40, you know, who works 40 hours over, the pay, over a two-week period, you know, kind of a half, you know, employee works half the time, they get they get 40 hours of paid sick leave. So you don't you know not every employee is getting 80 hours. Employees are getting kind of proportionate to how much they work. So if you have you know real part time employees working five hours a week, you don't have to you don't have to give them 80 hours of paid sick leave pursuant to this new law. They would get they would get that five hour they would get that five hours you know or 10 hours over the kind of two week period. Um, and so the re the reasons that an employee can you know can take this paid sick leave. Um, there's kind of listed out, you know, it's the employee subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation for COVID-19. The employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID-19. The employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 seeking a medical diagnosis. So don't even need to test positive, don't even need to have been ordered to self-quarantine. If an employee is just feeling sick, they think it may be COVID-19, the employee will be able to take this paid sick leave beginning on April 2nd. Um, if the employee is caring for an individual who's subject to an order as described in paragraph one or paragraph two. So that kind of goes back to the childcare situation. So you could have, you could have a waiter who they're, they're the only, you know, their son's childcare is closed down. They need to provide childcare for their son. Um, 
they, they can take paid sick leave under this new law. They're allowed, they're allowed to, you know, they're allowed to take off and, you know, as the acting child care provider, they can elect to use paid sick leave for that time, even though they themselves might feel fine. You know, the child might not have any medical issues. The child might not have been, you know, exposed to anyone with COVID-19. Just for child care purposes, um, you, you know, you can, you can use this paid sick leave. Um, and so to be paid, you know, the payment for this, to be paid at the employee's regular rate, you know, again, this has following caps similar to the FMLA, $511 per day or $5,110 in the aggregate for the uses described in one, two, or three. And you can all see on the PowerPoint, you know, that's when you're subject to the quarantine or isolation. That's when you've advised, been advised yourself to self-quarantine or you are experiencing symptoms. You can make up to $5,110. On the other hand, if it's for a reason four or five, you know, you're in the care mode. It's not you yourself who's sick or who may be sick, but you're caring for someone who's sick. Um, you can get $2,000 per day or up to $2,000 in the aggregate. Those are kind of the maximums that the employer might be, you know, on the hook for, for paid sick leave if they're used to their full extent. And, and finally, no, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, and so just kind of, as I mentioned, you know, this 80 hours of paid sick leave is available immediately. There's no accrual rate or period. You know, as of April 2nd, all your employees are going to have a paid sick leave bank, per, uh, you know, proportion to how many hours they work for you. Um, this applies to all employees, regardless of tenure. You know, if you have an employee who you hired 10 days, you know, the FMLA we just talked about, they need to have been employed by for 30 days. This, you know, that 30 day requirement doesn't apply here. If you have a, a one week employee, they get paid sick leave. If you have a three-week employee, they get paid sick leave. Um, applies to everyone regardless of tenure. Um, unused paid sick leave does not carry over from one year to the other. So, you know, again, this, pay, this paid sick leave is expected to, as of now, the law, you know, says that December 31st, 2020, this paid sick leave goes away. Well, someone who has 80, say someone this year, you know, as of April 2nd, they have 80, 80 paid sick leave hours in their bank. They don't use it this year. Law expires December 31st. You know, the Congress doesn't extend it. The president doesn't extend it. January next year, January 2021, they can't say, hey, wait a second. I want to use my 80 paid sick leave hours that I got last year from the Families First Act. They can't do that. So this is something that it's only applicable to this year. They can't carry it over if they don't use it. It's use it or lose it. Okay. Uh, use it or lose it, I guess, with respect to two things. Number one, by the end of this year, mm -hmm. uh, and then also... Um, before termination. It's not something that has to be paid out upon termination. And I say to use it or lose it, but it's not like normal PTO where the employee can decide whether to use it. It's still got to meet the requirements for one of the permissible purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, you know, to be clear, this is an addition to whatever PTO that you guys are already offering your folks. Um, you know, if, if you're already offering 40 hours of PTO, you can't say, all right, I've given you 40, here's another 40, now you're at 80. Right. This 80 is in addition to whatever PTO you're already offering. That's right. Anna, before we move on to the next subject, any questions on this? We've got so many questions on this. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So um, we'll just go through some of these you've already kind of addressed, but they might need to be revisited just a little bit. Um, the, the first one, I'll just start with what you just last said. Um, that the paid, this paid sick leave is in addition to any existing PTO currently provided by an establishment. However, is it possible, uh, I mean, because then what if someone already has paid sick leave for their employees for two weeks, right? So they have 80 hours and now this gives them an additional 80 hours. Can the restaurant or any, any company get rid of that already given 80 hours and just go with the acts? I think you could, I mean, I definitely think you could change your policy, right? If employees are accruing PTO, you could immediately change the policy so that they stop accruing any PTO. Uh, but as to the PTO that they've already accrued, that they've earned, uh, that's kind of theirs. I, I, would, I would caution against going ahead and uh, taking that away from the employees, given that it's already theirs and they've already earned it. It's going to come up. So, sure. Oh, no, I know. I know. <laughs> it definitely will. And I, and I bet a lot of employers will, will make the decision that they're going to go ahead and pull it back and, you know, they may get a claim out of it, they may not. Um, but I think the more well, prudent path would be if the employee has earned it, it's theirs. Exactly. It's theirs. And like maybe they're able to keep that sick bank. So maybe I have 60 hours in my already existing bank, right? And now I have this additional 80. And once I go through that first 60, like what do you burn first, basically? Well, if you're the... Um, uh, I, I don't think you can dictate to the employee, but if you're 
if you are, or can, can you dictate no, to so, it? So un, under the Act, you know, if, if it's for one of the reasons delineated by the Act, you're required to use the paid sick leave under the Act okay. first. You can't, okay. you can't use other PTO first if it's one of the reasons covered by the Act that we just went over. That has, that has to become first. And again, this 80-hour this 80, 80 sick leave grant can only be used for one of the reasons covered by the Act. It can't just be I'm going on a vacation. You know, it's, it's got to meet one of these one of these requirements, and, and the requirement probably that's going to come up the most is going to be school closure. Um, that's the one that's going to affect most people, right? Hopefully, it's not going to be that they they themselves have coronavirus or they've been around someone who has. Hopefully, it's just going to be the school issue. I think that's the one that's going to come up the most frequently. Okay, yeah. So, okay, let's let's just go through some of the questions we have coming in crazy, Mike. Um, so, Michael asks, with the extension on FMLA and the new additional two-week, 80-hour pay time off starting on April 2nd, will any of this be retroactive? No, Everything, none, none of this takes effect until April 2nd. April 2nd is when this takes effect. And as Ethan said, you know, unlike normal leave that may be accrued over a period of time, the 80 hours of paid sick leave here, the person's bank is full with 80 hours on April 2nd. Nothing is retroactive. And then with respect to the FMLA, that too doesn't take effect until April 2nd. So in theory, I don't think this is going to happen, um, but in theory, um, Governor Abbott has said that schools statewide must be closed through April 3rd, right? He very well could on April 3rd say schools are, per are permitted to open back again on Monday. I guess that's April 6th, right? Um, and schools could then make their own choice because some schools in Texas had decided to close before he ordered them to close. But let's assume all schools open back up on Monday, April 6th. Well, then really, with respect to the FMLA, the person could have only used that for one day, and that would have been that Friday, April 3rd. Uh, they would still have the 80 hours of paid sick leave. That's going to be in place through the end of the year. But if schools are back in session, then they're really only going to be used that for one of those other purposes, like maybe they have COVID-19. But right. no, nothing is retroactive. It all takes effect on April 2. And and Ethan noted that there's a way to get an exception for this. We don't know a lot about about a lot of bit about that yet. Of course, this law just came out 36 hours ago. Um, right. But there's a five employee threshold, but as Ethan said, if you've got, I think it was 50 or fewer employees and you think you can make a case why this shouldn't apply to you, I, I guess my recommendation on that would be to get on it um, yeah. because it's going to take effect in 13 days and uh, you're going to go ahead and have to start paying out those benefits potentially if someone has one of these qualifying reasons on April 2nd. Okay, and we do have sort of a sticky question related to that that I'll get to in a second, but um, one of the other questions is when is the refundable credit applied? I, I, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, not a, I, I'm not a tax lawyer, but I, I would assume that this is all going to be rolled in with the corporate tax returns that businesses would be filing. Normally do, I believe, in August at the end of the year, but as we saw today, the individual tax return deadline has been extended to July 15th. It's possible the corporate, ta corporate tax return deadline will be similarly extended, but I would think, and again, I don't know, this is just me talking off the cuff, I would think that this, uh, this tax benefit would all be a part of the corporate tax returns. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so here's some specific one. If we have a full-time employee who works less, well, they work less than 40 hours a week, do you still have to offer a full 80 hours of paid sick leave? No, so, so again, the, the paid sick leave is kind of proportionate to um, how much how much they're working. So if you have a, you know, if you have a 40 hour a week person, 80 hours over two weeks, they're going to get the entire 80 hours paid sick leave is in the bank. They wake up on April 2nd. It's, you know, it's, it's like a checks in your bank account. It's there. But if you have someone who's a part time, say this person, you know, this person works 20 hours a week. Um, they're not going to be they're not going to be entitled to that full 80. They, they would be getting half of that because they're working half of the week. They're working half of the 40 hours. So of that two week period of those 80 paid hours, they would only have worked 40 hours. So they'll get yeah. 40 paid hours of sick leave. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, okay, this is the sticky question that I was promising you guys. Um, <laughs> with expanded FMLA sick leave benefits to be made of, oh, are expanded FMLA and paid sick leave benefits to be made available to furloughed employees of businesses that are not open? It's a good question. So let me, let, me make, let me make sure I understand this question. So if a, a company, if a restaurant has, they've, they've closed the doors, they haven't right. terminated Completely. workers, but, Completely. but they have, go ahead. 
Like completely they're, closed and not doing yeah, drive through they, 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 They've closed, but they haven't laid off the employees. They've just put them on furlough, so they're still remaining on the payroll. Um, and they're continuing to be eligible for benefits. Um, then come, if they, if they stay in that furloughed state, come April um, 2, uh, would this law apply to them, I guess? And so would those people who are not getting paid then, if they were full-time, have 80 hours that they could then start using, for, I guess, carrying for the next two weeks or to take the FMLA and get paid, right? Um, that's a very good question. That's not, it's not, one, that I've, not one that I've thought of. Um, and again, we don't we don't really know how this is going to be applied because it just came out 36 hours ago. But but my gut reaction to that would be yes, because uh, my gut reaction is they're still employees um, um, that they would get that they would get it. But on the other hand, you know, you think about what Ethan just said that the amount of hours you get is going to be proportionate to that which you're working. And so if you're not working any hours, then should you indeed get the bucket? Um, I don't know the answer to the question. It's a very good one. And, and, and just kind of add on to what Tally said, you know, there's some very good questions here today. Unfortunately, you know, as this came out 36 hours ago, you know, as you guys have seen, we talked about the start of the day. This was 36 hours ago. Governor Abbott's order for, you know, the state of Texas was yesterday afternoon. Everything is in a state of flux. Um, you know, that's why it's important, you know, that Tally shared the DOL website. Um, look at the EEOC guidance website. You know, these, these are great resources for you guys because my guess is, you know, I don't know this, but I, I would venture a guess that someone's going to issue a guidance on that very question yeah. or something close to that where whoever asked that question, it's a great question. We don't know the answer. I bet a lot of other people are asking that question and someone's going to, you know, put out an answer for that to kind of let you guys know what the answer is. And so my guess is in the next couple of days, you know, the next week, We'll, we'll get we'll get some more detailed specific guidance to some of these more nuanced questions where I think they're just kind of rushing to get a law passed, you know, show the people, you know, here's something tangible that we can do, we can use to help. And they just frankly didn't have time to, you know, plan for all of these nuanced issues that come up when, you know, we're sitting here today, you know, less than two weeks out and saying, well, what about this situation? What about this situation? So I think kind of in these next couple of days, you know, people are going to realize, you know, you guys need guidance and, you know, we need answers to these. And, and DOL, I said, has put out guidance with respect to Fair Labor Standards Act issues. DOL is also the agency responsible for uh, enforcing and interpreting FMLA. And so mm -hmm. if an agency is to put out guidance, I think it would be DOL. Mm -hmm. So just check back with them. Also, just a little plug for our firm. I, I've been sending the TRA uh, information that we have available on our website relating to COVID virus, uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. We have a task force set up. I would just tell you all, it's all free content. Take advantage of it. It's at www.jacksonlewis.com. We're truly churning out probably 10 different articles or blog posts a day on there, various webinars, lots of state-specific content, too. I would just encourage you to visit that site, maybe, maybe at the start of your day or maybe at the end of your day. Look at what's been updated there, and I, I imagine, given this law takes effect by April 2, our firm will, will itself generate some frequently asked questions like this one. It's a great one, uh, and I will relay this to the task force and let them know this is one that came up. But I bet in the next week or two you'll see from our firm – if you don't see from DOL putting out FAQs uh, on this new law, because a lot of employers are going to have questions like that one, which is a very good one. Well, so I mean, just to get back to it, because there are some other, in interest of time, there's two that kind of come up with that question too. Yeah. When is the measurement taken for how much people are working, right? Like and how then, Yeah, and, and so I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm trying to recall the text, the text of the law, and, and I, I don't know if the law addressed that specifically. I think you know, that's something that will either be put out, you know, in one of the resources if it's, you know, a two-week period that from the last 30 days worked. I don't believe that the law had that specific requirement, um, but I, I think that's another good point where there will be, you know, it'll have to be clarified if it's not already what the look-back period is because, right, some employee, you know, if an employee works 80 hours a week, 80 or 40 hours a week for you every week, and you know took, took, vaca took vacation the last week before mm -hmm. this took effect, you know, right. your look-back period, if it's just two weeks, is going to say 40 hours. And, you know, yeah. that's not really that employee situation. So I, th I think there's going to be some more clarification on something like that going forward, too. And then, and then the, next, the, ne the obvious next question, which is a little harder to answer, right, is if you have closed and you furloughed, so you have your employees still getting benefits and paid, essentially, um, or, or receiving their benefits, is it then better to close and lay off your employees 
so that they can collect unemployment benefits and you can keep your liquidity as a business or whatever you're doing, basically. But it's a really tough call, but we're getting that question a lot. Yeah, it's a, tough, it's a tough call, and that's kind of something Ethan and I had chatted, out, chatted about mm -hmm. offline here was, you know, this law could have the unintended consequence of uh, incentivizing employers prior to April 2nd to go ahead and lay off employees, right, to terminate them so that they don't have to then make this sick leave available or have folks going out on paid FMLA. So it, it, it could have that consequence. Uh, and I think well, that's just a decision well, each business has. To think about, right? Like no one really wants to do that. But at the same time, with there are no customers coming in the door, there's right. no, yeah. you know, yeah. Right. I think it's a, it's a decision the business has to make, right? Uh, and, you know, what does that do to, you know, being able to retain those employees, hopefully when the business is able to open back up, right? Uh, are they going to still be around? Are they going to be willing to come back to work? But I will talk about unemployment a little later. And I know that there's some employees out there who are like, hey, if I'm not going to be working, if I'm not going to be paid, lay me off. Let me go out there and get unemployment. Let me go apply to the TWC. I can get, I think the TWC provides a maximum of 465 a week in unemployment. Let me make that claim. So that may be something that uh, the conversation might just simply need to be had too between employer and employee. Yeah, well, let's just, let's keep going. I, I know you still guys have some content to, to get through. Yeah. Sure. And then just kind of, you know, regarding paid sick leave, you know, this isn't, um, you know, there are there are three cities across Texas that have passed local paid sick leave laws um, that you should just kind of be aware of, kind of have in the back of your mind, um, at least with regard to San Antonio and Austin. Both the San Antonio and Austin paid sick leave ordinance just for those cities, those have been enjoined. What that means is, you know, there's pending litigation, so the courts have basically put a pause on that, put a hold on that, um, so those paid sick leave laws won't go into effect. Dallas, on the other hand, if you're a restaurant in Dallas, you know, I don't know kind of what the audience is here. So I'm just going to touch on this quickly. Um, you know, if there are more questions, we can kind of do that offline or another time. But just so Dallas, you know, Dallas restaurant um, owners are kind of aware of this, there's a Dallas paid sick leave that went to effect on August 1, 2019, but will be enforced as of April 1, 2020. So what that means is basically the city of Dallas said, you know, paid sick leave goes into effect August 1st, 2019, but we're going to give you some time to get into compliance. Um, so they're really not enforcing it. They're not making sure that, you know, the restaurants are compliant with it until April 1st. And that's, that's coming up in the next two weeks. So um, what that means is for, for you restaurants, you guys need to make sure that you're compliant with it moving forward, but also that your employees have the paid sick leave balance as of April 1st that they would have had since August 1st. So you've had time to get up to speed, up to compliance, and you need to make sure your compliance is retroactive through August 1st, the date the ordinance went into effect. All right, so moving on from FMLA and, and, and paid sick leave, now let's kind of talk about those difficult decisions that I mentioned at the outset and that we've kind of touched touched on a little bit throughout our program here. Uh, if you are uh, a business, an organization, and you're, you're trying to, you know, of course, you want to stay, you know, you want to stay cash flow positive here, uh, and you, you don't want to have to make these difficult decisions that affect your employees, but you may have to, just want to present some alternatives for you. Um, first one, of course, uh, if you want to keep everybody on board or you want to keep certain folks on board, is to consider pay reductions. Um, Non-exempt employees, again, whether they're tipped or not, as I mentioned, the only requirement there is that they be paid $7.25 an hour. Uh, so if you've got some staff, some cooks, uh, folks who are maybe, maybe making $10, $12 an hour, uh, you want to continue to employ them. You still need their services, but, you know, it's taking a hit to the business to continue to pay them at their rate. Um, you could consider changing their pay on a prospective basis, of course, uh, but maybe bringing them down to a lower level so long as ultimately they're still getting $7.25 for all hours worked. That's permissible, and then they've got to get, of course, time and a half if they work more than 40 hours in a week. Also, with respect to those salaried exempt folks, again, we're talking about your managers, your assistant managers. Um, you know, you can, you can certainly, again, with them, you can reduce their pay. Um, so long as uh, we all know that the Department of Labor increased the salary basis for uh, exempt employees, used to be 455 a week, now it's up to 684 a week. As long as their weekly salary still meets that level, it's fine to reduce their salary as well. Again, just make sure you're doing it on a prospective basis. Do it, you know, on the next pay period so that they're still paid at their, at their prevailing rate for the entire pay period before you make that change. 
Um, so pay reduction, that's one option. Furloughs, uh, seems like the group is uh, considered furlough since we've gotten a question or two about furloughs. And I've mentioned them earlier, but furlough is something that you can use as an organization to keep people employed uh, so they can continue receiving they can continue receiving employee benefits um, for, for, from you, uh, but they're not working and so you're not having to pay them. Um, again, with the hourly workers, you only got to pay them when they work, so it's not an issue if they're not coming in. With the salaried folks, and this really doesn't impact you all a lot in the restaurants, but as I said earlier, if they're, if they're uh, off and they're on a furloughed week, uh, you just got to make sure they're not performing any work. Um, you know, for example, in some industries, someone might be at home checking emails or responding to calls, and I guess that could happen here too if we're talking about managers. You don't want that to happen uh, because then you would have to pay them their salary for the whole week because they performed work during that week. So if you're going to utilize furloughs and you're going to have people off for periods of time, make sure they are truly not performing any duties for you because exempt or non-exempt, you're going to have to pay them. Uh, one other thing to mention here, uh, I don't do employee benefits myself, neither does Ethan, but we have about 50 lawyers in our firm who do. Uh, and I know one of the things that always comes up with respect to furloughs and terminations is, uh, yeah, but how long can someone stay on the benefits plans? Um, and that's something that is unique with each organization. It's going to be unique to the plan that you have for your benefits. And so, you know, I would, I would, I guess, tell you to consult with your broker, your benefits broker, uh, consult the plan documents if you have them yourself. But I know that there are some plans where if someone has not performed work for a certain period of time, even though they're still on your employee role, um, at some point in time, they will lose their coverage. And it's varies depending upon what the plan is, but just because someone's an employee, you know, if they haven't performed work for you for maybe it's 60 days, 90 days, again, it can vary. Uh, at some point, they will lose their coverage, and so you just want to be mindful of that. Consult the broker and consult the plan. Layoffs. Um, you know, we use the term layoff, and a lot of people use layoff to mean, hey, we're, we're you know, we're kind of going to separate with you, but we really intend to bring you back on. It's perfectly fine to call it a layoff, um, but, you know, at least in Texas, the law is going to look at it as a termination, right? So you can say, uh, you know, we're laying you off or we're just going to separate for a bit. Call it what you want. Bottom line is it's, it's a termination. And so if you are doing layoffs or if you are just calling it a termination, one thing you've got to be mindful of is the final pay requirement. This comes from the Texas Payday Act, of course, because this is an involuntary separation. Final pay needs to be made within six days of informing the employee of the discharge. Uh, again, benefits issues come up here just as they would when you're laying off any or terminating any employee, um, just as it would before COVID-19. Uh, if someone's been on your employee benefits, again, consult your plan as to when the benefits are going to end. But probably the benefits are going to end either on the date of termination or the date of layoff or perhaps maybe on the last day of the month. That's what a lot of employers that we work with, a lot of what their plans look like. And then finally, make sure the COBRA notices go out if someone has been on employee benefits. Uh, you want to make sure that you inform uh, the plan that someone has lost coverage, and then you want to make sure that that individual gets the COBRA notice uh, so that they have the opportunity themselves to go ahead and continue the group health benefits plans through COBRA. Obviously more expensive, but um, it, it is an option for uh, individuals who have been separated or laid off. So make sure that those notices go out. Um, WARN, this might not apply and probably doesn't apply to a lot of the um, organizations and restaurants participating in this webinar, but it's something I do want to mention. Um, WARN is the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. It's a federal law. Um, luckily, we're fortunate here in Texas. We don't, as a lot of states do, have what's called a mini-WARN statute. As I said, Texas doesn't have any wage and hour laws. It also doesn't have this mini WARN law. Um, but what WARN generally requires is if you're an organization that has 100 employees or more, again, think about this the same way I said earlier with respect to the Families First Act. This isn't just at one restaurant. Uh, this is, is with respect to the company. If the company has 100 employees or more, and then you have a plant closing or a mass layoff, and those are defined terms, uh, and, and they're a little bit difficult to understand, but if you go look at the DOL's website, web page, it'll explain perfectly what a, a plant closing or a mass layoff is. If you're having one of those things, just note that you've got to give 
60 days notice to the workers, then you've got to give 60 days notice to the government of the plant closing and the mass layoff. And it can be triggered, Warren can, by laying off as, minim, as, as few as 50 employees, depending upon the total workforce site. Again, the particulars of when a mass layoff or a plant closing are triggered, you can find that just by going to DOL or going to Google and go, go, in Googling Warren, uh, Warren triggers or Warren uh, mass layoff or plant closing, and you'll get the details on that. Tom, and then, yeah. Tom, on the, on the Warren, I, I've been hearing, um, I learned a lot about employment law recently um, and okay. warning notices specifically. 60 days, that's a lot of time. And then people would also be susceptible to this paid sick leave thing that just got passed too, right? Like if we have a restaurant, we have restaurants that uh, we have high volume restaurants around the state that have easily more than 100 employee, employees. Right. To give sick leave notice, um, I mean, everything changes every day with a pandemic. So how does, how does this work? Well, it's, it's a good question. So some states, as I said, have many WARN statutes. A lot of those states recognize that, look, if, if we've got to give, depending on the statute, I think the mini WARN in New Jersey is 90 days. Um, but a lot of the states have relaxed the mini WARNs or they've just said, look, given the environment that we're in, you don't have to comply with the mini WARNs. To my knowledge, the federal government hasn't issued such a proclamation with respect to the federal WARN. And so at this point, uh, WARN still is in play. I know that our COVID-19 task group is advising tons of employers uh, by the hour with respect to WARN issues. But WARN is still something that right now employers have to comply with, uh, and they've got to still give that 60 days notice. Uh, okay, question. <laughs> Can people like, I mean, this, if, okay. Can you lay off certain numbers of your staff and not trigger the warn notice? You can, yeah. There's, and, and, and I apologize, I don't have the, the exact details in front of me, but there is a way to do that. Yes, you can stagger layoffs. Yeah. Uh, and if you stagger them, if you stagger them properly, then you can avoid a triggering event, which then requires the warn notices to go out. There is a way to properly stagger them. Yes, there is. I'm not trying to get people to dodge things. It's just, this is a crazy time. Like. No, no, I know, no, I know, I know. Um, and then the other thing with respect to layoffs I wanted to be mindful of, or I want you to be mindful of, and I mentioned this a minute ago, is just unemployment benefits. Um, because, you know, if, if, if you're not paying your employees or if you've reduced their hours to the point where maybe they're making below 465 a week, uh, then perhaps layoff is the right move for those employees. Um, they may request it even, as I said earlier. Um, and if somebody does, um, you know, needs to get benefits if, if you want to help educate them so that they can go get those benefits. Just point them to the Texas Workforce Commission. They can apply online or they can apply by phone. I know I was looking at the TWC's webpage earlier, though, and they're recommending people apply online because their phones are just ringing off the hook, um, given the amount of workers who have been laid off and are seeking those benefits. One thing that happened earlier this week is Governor Abbott did relax two requirements with respect to unemployment benefits. Number one, normally there's a week waiting period after someone has been approved for benefits before they can get them. He has dispensed with that for the immediate future. Uh, and then second of all, normally to get unemployment benefits, you have to show that you've been looking for work uh, and trying to get a new job in order to continue receiving those benefits. But given that likely employers aren't going to be looking to bring on new employees at this time, he has dispensed with that requirement for the immediate future as well. And then we also, in just preparing for this presentation, we saw something on the TWC's webpage, and it's mentioned in those frequently asked questions that I said that you guys can pull up by going to their webpage. We saw something, frankly, that I wasn't familiar with before, and that's a shared work program. And this is something that's an alternative to layoffs. Uh, it's something that you might want to consider with your workers. This is something that the employer, though, has to go apply for with the TWC. It's not something the employee would initiate, but you as the employer could go to the TWC and request this shared work program. Uh, and this, according to the TWC, is where 10% of your employees are having their hours reduced by at least 10%, but not more than 40%. And so this is a, um, a mechanism, I guess, whereby the employer's earnings can be supplemented through this shared work program with the TWC. So again, if that's something that, that you're interested in exploring uh, with your workers, check out the TWC's webpage, go to those FAQs. It provides the link and how to apply. Uh, and then there's a little bit more details about the program as a whole. So those are, that's, that's what we had to cover today. Um, again, these are our, this is our contact information, our phone numbers, as well as our email addresses. Uh, you can reach out to us at any time, I believe, uh, in connection with our um, 
uh, sponsoring with the TRA, the Law Center uh, members, I believe, are entitled to send us, I think it's up to two questions, um, I think it's a year, I think, um, I could be wrong on that, but I think it's two questions a year. Um, and so if you do have questions, just feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. As I said, a lot of this, uh, guys, is, it's, uh, it's evolving rapidly. Um, and so just like we can't answer all of your questions right now, even if you reach out to us, we might not be able to answer them at that time, but um, we will be able to get the information from others in our firm who are dealing with these issues more frequently than we are, or uh, as the answers become more clear, for example, with the Families First Coronavirus Act, where it was just, come at, just came out and there wasn't any guidance issued. Um, so questions can be sent to us there. Uh, also, if you've got any more questions, we've, we do have a little bit of time to hang around. So uh, you've answered most of the questions that are in the queue. You guys were very thorough. I appreciate it. One right. question that did come up earlier, though, that we haven't really addressed is if an employee has symptoms and has not seen a doctor and they go on paid sick leave after the April 2nd um, deadline, how long can they get paid sick leave without seeing a doctor to confirm how long can they COVID? You so, so I, I believe um, I, I would need to look at it again, but I, I believe if they are experiencing symptoms of it, um, experiencing if the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis, um, that they are eligible for this paid sick leave. So, if, if if they're still in the process of trying to talk to a doctor, or you know, they've taken the test, they're waiting for the test, you know, that's covered. If it's you know the employees. Sick, they're not sure if it's COVID-19. They go take a test. Two days later, comes back. It's negative. You know, the employee has a cold. You know, right. the the paid this this paid sick leave is not designed to cover that. Um, so at that, at that point, they would be, you know, expected to return or you know take other you know take other PTO. They wouldn't be covered by this paid sick leave for that reason anymore. Once they got that negative diagnosis. And I guess it's just going to depend on restaurant policies. Say if I'm a restaurant owner and I don't have any um, paid time off, uh, you know, rules with my, with my company right now, and this goes into effect and someone shows up and has symptoms or has a fever and I say, you're on paid sick leave for now. And then they, you know, because under the assumption that it's related to COVID-19, maybe it takes two days to get a diagnosis or, or just seek medical attention. Uh, and then they get the test back that might take another couple of days. Um, yeah. And then it comes back and they have a cold and now they've been out of work paid for five days. I guess it's up to the individual restaurant donor if they're going to force that employee to pay it back or how does that work? I probably would, I wouldn't get into the situation of having them pay anything back. Uh, right. it's, oh. it's, it's just then a question of if they've used five days you know, are, are, they, are they need have, they have to come back to work and you're not going to let them stay out on this paid right. leave any longer. But right. I don't think under any circumstance would I advise that um, someone be required to pay back yeah. um, any of the, any of the, the leave that's been granted to them. Yeah, because it's under the assumption that that's what they're out for. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's going well, to be difficult to show that they weren't either. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's yeah. not like they're sending in their medical, you know, diagnosis with all this either. Guys, this is a very complicated issue. I am so appreciative of you to break this down, especially with the new act that just came out less than 48 hours ago. For y'all to understand it so well, so quickly, I, I really appreciate it. I know that our guests really do too, and I can't wait to put this recording up online so that tons more people can get the answers that they're looking for, because we're getting phone calls constantly about all of these issues. So I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you all for having us. As I said, one more time, uh, it's all complimentary. Take advantage of it. Go to our website, www.jacksonlewis.com. Uh, at the very first page, we've got it up right now. I think it says COVID-19. It's our task force. Click on that link there, and then it'll take you to a landing page. Scroll all the way down. There's all the articles that we've posted since going back to January on COVID-19. Uh, we also link to the relevant governmental guidance. We also post links to archived webinars that we've done on this subject uh, matter our firm has and, and webinars to be scheduled in the future. Again, complimentary. Take advantage of all of that content. Um, go to it, as I said, daily and look at it because everything is evolving. Take advantage of it. And then also, as I said, check out the EEOC, check out the TWC and look to the DOL for guidance. That too is going to be changing by the day. It is. But thank you guys very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. And you've got our contact info. And if not, just reach out to Anna. She'll give it to you guys. And if there's any follow-up questions, 
uh, reach out to us. And, and, and apologies for not being able to answer a couple of the questions, but I'm glad we were able to answer a lot of them. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.